Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Manisha. I'm gonna be, um, in partnership with Ann Deitch, my colleague, I'm gonna be presenting on section GG. And lucky you all, you get to hear us to the end of the day. So all that stands between you and maybe a rainy walk is this presentation. Um, we will have a little bit of a break in between Ann and I. So um, given that we're starting a few minutes early, we may be able to get to a break early too. I'll do my best. So as with all these presentations, we start off with the acronyms that you all have in your packets. Um, they're also presented here. I'm just gonna zip through these slides. So after this training, you should be able to articulate the intent of Section GG, demonstrate a working knowledge of Section GG, explain the item definitions, which we're gonna go through each one, and then we'll also be applying coding instructions to accurately code practice uh, scenarios and case study. So this is a pretty interactive presentation. If you haven't used Slido till now, we will be using it quite a bit. So make sure you have it up on your phone and laptops. Um, the second bullet on this slide refers specifically to the fact that section GG items are standardized um, and speaks more to standardized items. So we'll talk more about that on this slide here. You've heard about the Impact Act through several of the presentations this morning. In 2014, the Impact Act was passed. So in 2016, when Section GG was developed, it was developed to meet the provisions of the Impact Act and has been implemented across all four PAC settings listed on the screen here. And as you can see by this diagram, the objective is to have uniformity amongst the ERF settings, SNF settings, long-term care hospitals, and home health agencies. So the intent of Section GG is to include items about functional abilities and goals focused on prior function, admission performance, discharge goals, and discharge performance. Residents in SNFs, as we all know, have self-care and mobility limitations and are at risk for further functional decline. So we generally say there's four items to focus on with Section GG. We start with prior functioning in everyday activities and prior device use, both of which are assessed on admission. And then GG0130 self-care and GG0170 mobility is addressed on both admission and discharge. There are some of the section GG0130 and GG0170 data elements on the optional IPA, which is used in the PDPM. I know you guys heard a bit about that this morning and I am gonna touch on that a little bit before we get into some of the coding scenarios this afternoon. So two years ago in rulemaking, the SNF QRP added four new quality measures that are listed um, on the next slide. Um, the objective behind these was to meet the requirements again of the Impact Act, addressing the domain of functional status and cognitive function and changes in function and cognitive function. Use data elements currently collected in the MDS, Section GG, and add and modify data elements. Includes standardized data elements used across the four pack settings. And they were also adopted functional outcome measures previously endorsed by the NQF for EARFs. Data collection, as many of you will know, um, began for these measures in October of last year. So here we have the SNF QRP function measures. The first measure is the existing process measure, and the four following that are the new outcome measures. So NQF 2633, which is the change in self-care for skilled nursing facility residents. 2634, which is the change in mobility score for SNF residents. 2635 is the discharge self-care score for SNF residents and then 2636 is the discharge mobility score for SNF residents. So the assessment where data are initially collected is the Part A PPS admission assessment. This is the five-day PPS assessment where A0310B equals 01, and this is the first Medicare required assessment to be completed when a resident is admitted for a SNF Part A stay. 
This functional assessment must be completed within the first three days. That's the first three calendar days. So let's say somebody was admitted to your facility today. They'd have the balance of today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, ending officially at 11.59 on day three. We're gonna briefly go through interim performance and um, what you can expect to see when this rolls out in October. I know Terry mentioned some about the optional IPA this morning. I'm gonna to try to go through a little bit more detail um, with specifically related to section GG. So the interim performance column was added to support the PDPM's unscheduled PPS assessment, the interim payment assessment or IPA. The IPA is an optional assessment that may be completed by providers to report changes in the resident's PDPM classification. The ARD for the IPA is determined by the provider and may be set for any day within the SNF stay, but must be beyond the ARD of the five-day assessment. I just want to iterate, reiterate here again that the IPA is not used for the SNF QRP, but is only collected for the PDPM, and when completing the IPA, the assessment period or, or look back reflects whatever the assessment period or look back is for the particular items being completed. So scoring the um, interim performance uh, activities in the assessment, the providers are gonna use the same six point scale and activity not attempted codes, which we use currently for section GG, um, and it captures the interim functional performance of the residents. There have been several editions of the word interim in the RAI manual to support this new assessment. And this is what it looks like, what you guys will see. So these are the three GG0130 items that are on the interim performance. As you can see here, it looks very similar to what you, how you would code admission and discharge performance for section GG. And then on this slide, we can see the um, Part A PPS mobility interim performance. So this is the GG0170 items. Okay, so the Part A PPS discharge assessment is required to be completed when the resident's Medicare Part A stay ends, and this is documented in A2400C, end of most recent Medicare stay, either as a standalone assessment when the resident's Medicare Part A stay ends, but the resident stays in the facility, or it can be combined with an OBRA assessment discharge if the Medicare uh, part A stay ends on the day of or one day before the resident's discharge date, which is documented in A2000. Regardless of the length of stay, admission performance and discharge goals are coded on every admission assessment, and that's the start of the Part A PPS stay. There's one column for admission and a different uh, column for goals. If the resident does have an incomplete stay, complete admission performance, admission performance and discharge goals. So if they were admitted, say for example, and discharged prior to what was originally planned, you would still complete that first one and then discharge self-care and mobility performance items are not required for residents with an interrupted stay. For residents with an incomplete stay, such as resident with an emergency discharge, the self-care and mobility items are skipped so residents with incomplete stays include residents who are unexpectedly discharged to acute care, psychiatric, or long-term care hospital because of a medical emergency, resident's death, or again, if the Medicare Part A stay is less than three days. And we can see here how those different scenarios would be coded out and what you would include. I'm gonna briefly go over now the changes to section GG. So one thing that we changed, and this is usually when you see changes in Section GG, it's based on feedback and help desk questions. So I know Robin just re uh, referenced those help desk. We really do appreciate the questions that we get in there. So definitely keep them coming. But this is where those changes and coding tip revisions usually come from. So GG0110C mechanical lift includes sit to stand, stand assist. We added stair lift and full body style lifts. And then we also clarified here, so step one 
for the self-care, uh, GG0130 self-care and GG0170 mobility steps for assessment. Um, we revised self-care performance to include incorporating resident self-report. And then we added the statement for the interim payment assessment. The assessment period for section GG is the last three days. So that's the ARD and two days prior. And then we also clarified step number five in the steps for assessment. So current, uh, we had the admission functional assessment should be conducted prior to the resident benefiting from treatment interventions in order to reflect the resident's true admission baseline functional status. For GG0130 performance coding, we would like to remind providers that the resident self-report should be used prior to using activity, not attempted codes. And we also added the definition of contact guard to 04 supervision touching assistance. There is a decision tree now available, which is a tool that guides the providers in uh, coding the resident's performance on the assessment instrument. And the decision tree is also in all of your folders. I think it's handout number 11, if I'm not mistaken. And again, we wanna reiterate, they would only use the activity not attempted codes if the activity did not occur during the three day assessment period. And you would only use these if the resident did not perform the activity during the three day assessment period, and if a helper did not perform that activity for the resident. As I just mentioned, this decision tree is also available to you all in um, your handout. It's also on that SNF QRP website that Robin was just talking about in her presentation. So another thing we added to address coding of eating when a resident receives tube, food, tube feeding, excuse me, or parenteral nutrition, eating involves bringing food and liquids to the mouth and swallowing food. The administration of tube feeds and parenteral nutrition is not considered when coding this activity. The following is guidance for some situations in which a resident receives tube feedings or parenteral nutrition. References to parenteral nutrition were added throughout coding tips for this item. Another change that you'll see in section GG is car transfers, which is item GG0170G. Um, we said that car transfer use um, of an indoor car can be used to simulate outdoor car transfers. These half or full cars would need to have similar physical features of a real car for the purpose of simulating a car transfer, that is a car seat within a car cabin. The car transfer item does not include transfers into the driver's seat, opening or closing the car door, fastening or unfastening the seat belt. And the car transfer item includes the resident's ability to transfer in and out of the passenger seat of a car or car simulator. We also added this coding tip. In the event of inclement weather or if an indoor car simulator or outdoor car is not available during the entire three-day assessment period, then use of code 10 not attempted due to environmental limitations would be used. Um, the examples had several edits made to clarify. Again, we request you all to read through the RAI manual to see some of these changes. Okay, we're gonna move on to prior functioning now, which is GG0100. This item is used in the risk adjust adjustment for the quality measures and does uh, gives knowledge regarding the resident's functioning prior to the current illness exacerbation or injury. And we believe that this does inform treatment goals as well. So prior functioning everyday activities looks like this. On the screen, you can see um, the coding in the yellow. Um, on the right-hand side, you have different groups of activities, so self-care, indoor mobility or ambulation, stairs, and then functional cognitions. And on the left-hand side, that's highlighted in yellow here on the screen, you can see the coding. Um, often, clinicians won't have a lot of detail in terms of what the resident's uh, ability immediately prior to the illness that occurred. Um, but that's where we ask that you talk to uh, the family members or sometimes you know, you might need to talk to other staff within the facility to determine that information. So we'll go through each one now just so we can get the definitions down. Um, GG0100A self-care is uh, code the patient's need for assistance with bathing, dressing, using the toilet or eating prior to the current illness, exacerbation or injury. 
GG0100B, which is indoor mobility or ambulation code the patients need for assistance with walking from room to room with or without an assistive device such as a cane, crutch, or walker prior, again, to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Next, we have GG0100C, which is stairs. In this, we code the patient's need for assistance with internal or external stairs with or without a device, again, such as a cane, crutch, or walker, once again, prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And then finally, we have GG0100D, which is functional cognition. Code the patient's need for assistance with planning regular tasks, such as shopping or remembering to take medication prior, again, to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. So the steps for assessment, again, this is mostly self-report by the resident or family, and you can also look at the resident's medical records to check and see if it's been documented. Again, these are the coding instructions. We want to record the resident's usual ability to perform self-care, indoor mobility or ambulation, stairs, and functional cognition prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Again, just something to notice and pay attention to here is that these coding responses differ from the six-point scale and the activity not attempted codes. Just a coding tip when the, um, going through this section, if no information about the resident's ability is available, after attempts to interview the resident or his or her family and after reviewing the resident's medical record, there is a code eight unknown and that's where you would use this code. Okay, next we have prior device use, which is GG0110. Um, the reason we have this in here, again, is used um, in the risk adjustment of the quality measurement, uh, excuse me, quality measures, and knowledge of the resident's routine use and devices and aids immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, again, also informs the treatment goals. So this is what it looks like when you're completing. This is completed only, again, um, at admission, entry, or re-entry at the start of the SNF PPS day. So that's the five-day PPS. Um, there is a, a, a limited list here of mobility devices. We have manual wheelchair, motorized wheelchair, and or scooter, mechanical lift, walker, orthotics, or prosthetics, or none of the above. And the steps for assessment, again, asking the resident or family member about prior device use and then checking the medical record. You would only report devices and aids used immediately prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury in this section. One question that we frequently get when we present this is why doesn't cane get coded in GG0110? Um, and I'd just like to inform you all, the devices listed in prior device use are included on the MDS because they're risk adjusters for the functional outcome measures. When we were developing the functional outcome measures, we did test whether prior use of cane or crutches affected either self-care or mobility outcomes, and we found that these devices did not affect functional outcomes. For that reason, we decided not to include them on the list of devices. So again, here you'll see the coding instructions for GG0110. Um, you would check the all the devices that applied, and there is an option to check Z, which is none of the above, if the resident did not use any of the listed devices. So this means that none of the devices listed A through E were used. That's when you would check Z, none of the above. GG0110C, mechanical lift. This is any device a resident or caregiver requires for lifting or supporting the resident's body weight. Um, some examples are listed here on this. This is not an uh, you know, exhaustive list, and there are other examples, but the ones we included um, are stair lift, hoyer lift, and bathtub lift. Excuse me. And then GG0110 walker, you include all walker types um, in this item. And it's, again, here's a list of some examples, um, not an uh, all exhaustive list. Um, pickup walkers, hemi walkers, rolling walkers, Platform walkers, four-wheel walkers, rollator walkers, knee walkers, or walkers for, immobilize, for mobilizing while seated in the walker. 
Okay, we're gonna watch a scenario of an assessing clinician. Um, this interview is occurring in what we call an ADL suite in a SNF. Um, and this is a room that's outfitted like an apart apartment. Um, so this is why the environment may appear more homelike when you're watching the video. Let's watch a scenario of an assessing clinician collecting information from multiple sources to code GG0110 prior device use. I noticed you have a few different devices here, Mr. Smith. Which of these were you using to help you walk just before you went to the hospital? I wasn't using anything. I was walking on my own. How's it going? Can I help answer anything? I was just asking your husband which of these devices he used to help him walk before going to the hospital. Oh, he was using that cane over there to help him get around. Oh, yeah, I guess I was using that. Okay, good. It also says here in your hospital discharge paperwork that you're using a walker before you were admitted. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess I used that when I went outside. Okay, and I see a wheelchair over there. Were you also using that? Uh, no, that's mine. I was using it when I had chemotherapy last year. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And were you using anything else like a shoe insert or a chairlift in another room, anything like that? No, that's all. Just what I told you. Okay, so now um, this is one of those Slido opportunities for you all. So how would you code GG0110 prior device use? Your options are A, manual wheelchair, B, which is D for walker, C, check both A and D, or D, check Z, none of the above. And I see some responses still coming in. It looks like we're predominantly saying B. I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to put in your responses. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the correct answer. And it is in fact D Walker, that's what you would check. Um, so the clinician used multiple sources of information when they were uh, determining what Mr. Smith used um, prior to his recent hospitalization. So we learned that he was using a walker and a cane because prior use of cane, as I mentioned, is not captured in GG0110 only option D, Walker, would be checked. Um, the reason collecting multiple uh, information from multiple sources is good is it usually ensures accuracy, as we can see, saw from this video. Mr. Smith wasn't using anything, and suddenly when his wife came in, there were more devices that were being used. So if, he didn't, if the clinician asking the question didn't use those multiple sources, he may not have gotten all that information. Um, and again, devices coded for prior use may be used for indoors and or outdoors. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started now with some of the self-care. Um, I'll go through all the self-care examples, and then we should that should take us to the break um, here. So GG0130, the intent of GG0130 and GG0170 is to identify the resident's ability to perform listed self-care um, and mobility activities and discharge goals, respectively. Um, again, it is a three-day assessment period. I wanna just emphasize that, and it can be based on direct observation, the resident self-report, and reports from clinicians, care staff, or family members documented in the medical record during the three-day assessment period. The steps for assessment, of course, as I mentioned, qualified and licensed clinicians assess the resident's performance based on direct observation or reports from the patient or resident, clinicians, care staff, and or family. There is an emphasis, again, on the three-day assessment period, and CMS anticipates that an interdisciplinary team of qualified clinicians is involved in assessing the resident during the three-day assessment period. One thing um, that's important is residents should be allowed to perform the activities as independently as possible as long as they're safe. And just on that note, um, in order to sometimes perform the activities as independently as possible, residents also need that time to perform the activities. And as long as they're safe, it's important to give the residents that time in order to accurately code what their abilities are. Um, so if helper assistance is required because a resident's performance is unsafe or if poor quality, you would score according to the type and amount of assistance provided. 
for the purposes of completing Section GG, a helper is defined as facility staff who are not direct employees and facility contracted employees, so that's rehab staff or nursing agency staff. It doesn't include individuals hired, compensated or not by individuals outside of the facility's management and administration, such as hospice staff, nursing or certified nursing assistant students, et cetera. When helper assistance is required because a resident's performance is unsafe, only consider facility staff when scoring according to the type and amount of assistance provided. And again, it is important to refer, excuse me, to facility, federal, and state policies and procedures to determine which SNF staff members may complete an assessment. Resident assessments are to be done in compliance with facility, federal, and state requirements. So you heard me mention it quite a few times. I'm gonna talk now again about the three-day assessment period. So um, the admission assessment period, the first three days are of the Part A stay, starting with the date in A2400B, start of the most recent Medicare stay, and the following two days ending again at 11.59 p.m. on day three. Um, you would code the resident's functional status based on a clinical assessment of the resident's performance that occurs soon after the resident's admission. The admission function scores are to reflect the resident's admission status and are to be based on an assessment. With the discharge, the Part A PPS discharge assessment is required to be completed when the resident's Medicare Part A stay ends as documented in A2400C, end of most recent Medicare stay, either as a standalone assessment, again, or may be combined with an OBRA discharge if the Medicare Part A stay ends on the day of or one day before the resident's discharge date. I'm gonna to touch briefly now on usual status. Um, if tra uh, resident's functional status uh, should be based again on a clinical assessment of the resident's performance that occurs soon after the resident's admission. The resident's functional assessment when possible should be conducted prior to the resident benefiting from treatment interventions in order to reflect the resident's true admission baseline functional status. This does not mean that treatment should be withheld. In fact, we specifically say treatment should not be withheld in order to conduct the functional assessment. For discharge, you would code the resident's discharge functional status based again on a clinical assessment of resident's performance that occurs as close to the time of resident's discharge from the Medicare Part A as soon as, as possible. So, usual status. This item tends to cause quite a little bit of confusion, so I will try to clear some of that up. A resident's functional status can be impacted by the environment or situations encountered at the facility. Observing the resident's interactions with others in different locations and circumstances is important for a comprehensive understanding of the resident's functional status. If the resident's status varies, we say record the resident's usual ability to perform each activity. So you wouldn't record the resident's best performance and their worst performance. Instead, you would record the resident's usual performance. There is um, an element of clinical judgment that's being, uh, that is required um, to some degree when coding usual performance. Um, there may be several opportunities to observe a resident performing an activity, or there may only be one opportunity. Um, so that, again, is where clinical judgment would need to be used. I have listed here on this uh, slide the coding instructions in the six-point scale, and we're gonna go through, again, several examples, but this should, be, should not be new information to many of you here in the room and online. Um, the coding instructions uh, start with 06, which is independent, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, 04, which is supervision or touching assistance, 03, which is partial or moderate assistance, um, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, and O1, dependent. And O4 does now include the contact card as well. So if the resident does not attempt the activity and a helper does not complete the activity for the resident for the entire three-day assessment period, and I emphasize that on purpose, um, you would code the reason for the uh, acti why the activity was not attempted. I have them listed here on this slide, so code 07 would be the resident refused to complete the activity. 09 not applicable would be the uh, activity was not attempted and the resident did not perform this activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Code 10 would mean that 
the activity was not attempted due to environmental limitations. So for example, lack of equipment or weather constraints. Code 88 would be not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. And that is the activity um, was not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. So we are gonna go through one, um, this is a provider Q&A. Um, and we had a question asked, um, can you provide scenarios in which a resident would be scored 10 for an item? So the answer we have here is we do not expect code 10 not attempted due to environmental limitations to be used often. If a resident is unable to go outside due to inclement weather, such as snow or cold temperatures, and no indoor option for uneven surfaces is available, Code the activity GG0170L, walk 10 feet on uneven surfaces as 10 not attempted due to environmental limitations. For GG0170R, wheel 50 feet with two turns. If the resident is obese and you do not have a wheelchair that is the appropriate size for the resident, you would code 10 not attempted due to environment limitation, environmental limitations excuse me, due to the lack of equipment. So now we're going to review um, each coding option in the six-point scale in greater detail. We'll walk through the decision tree for coding GG0130 self-care and GG0170 mobility, highlighting each coding level using the example of a resident, Mrs. Jones, completing GG0170D sit to stand. This again is a video, um, and the decision tree will present you with a series of yes-no questions. In the video, it's represented with diamonds that guide you to the correct code for your resident. I do recommend having the decision tree out too as we go through some of the practice scenarios. I reference it all the time when I'm trying to code a situation that comes in on help desk um, that I'm not sure of. So it is good to have handy in case you haven't pulled it out from your folders yet. So we'll go ahead and watch this video now. We will walk through the decision tree for coding GG0130, self-care, and GG0170, mobility, highlighting each coding level using an example of a patient, Mrs. Jones, completing GG0170D, sit to stand. The decision tree presents a series of yes-no questions, represented by diamonds, that guide you to the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety, appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. The first question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident complete the activity, with or without assistive devices, by him or herself and with no assistance, including physical, verbal, or nonverbal cueing, setup, or cleanup? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 06 independent. Let's view an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit to stand activity independently. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, she safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds on to the walker to steady herself. There is no assistance provided by a helper. If, however, the answer to this first question is no, the patient or resident is not able to complete the activity by him or herself without assistance, proceed to the next question. The second question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 05, Setup or Cleanup Assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit to stand activity, but this time with setup or cleanup assistance. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail. Mrs. Jones grasps the bed rail and safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this example, the patient completes the activity by herself with setup assistance. Setup assistance is demonstrated by the helper raising the bed rail. So, you would code this 05, setup or cleanup assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, 
the patient or resident requires more than setup or cleanup assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The third question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need only verbal or nonverbal cueing or steadying, touching, or contact guard assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 04, supervision or touching assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with supervision or touching assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail and provides cues for hand placement. I'm going to tell you how to do it safely. The helper also provides instructions to help Mrs. Jones safely rise to a standing position. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs verbal and nonverbal cueing from one helper, so you would use code 04, supervision or touching assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than supervision or touching assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fourth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support, from one helper with the helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 03, partial, moderate assistance. Let's review an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with partial, moderate assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Hey, Mrs. Jones. Oh, good morning. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around her waist, and provides instructions regarding the transfer. One hand on the rail. You're going to put one on the hand on the bed. Uh -huh. We're going to go on the count of three, all right? Then, while holding Mrs. Jones, the helper provides a slight upward boost using the gate belt. Mrs. Jones, who is bearing most of the weight, rises safely to a standing position. In this example, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing less than half of the effort, so you would code this 03, partial, moderate assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than partial, moderate assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fifth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support from one helper, with the helper providing more than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 02, substantial, maximal assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with substantial, maximal assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, and provides instruction regarding the transfer. We're going to work together. Okay. Okay, on the count of three. Three. Okay. Using the gate belt, the helper lifts Mrs. Jones, bearing most of her weight during the transfer. One, two, two. three. The helper provides continual assistance as she moves Mrs. Jones to a standing position. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing more than half of the effort, so you would code this 02, substantial, maximal assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than substantial, maximal assistance from one helper to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The sixth and final question in the decision tree asks, does the helper provide all the effort to complete the activity, or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 01, dependent. Let's review a final example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time the patient is dependent on two helpers to complete the activity. In this scene, two helpers are assisting Mrs. Jones. One helper secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, while the other helper provides instructions about the transfer. On three, we're going to stand up. One, two, 
Three all the way up tall. Okay. Both helpers provide continual assistance as they move Mrs. Jones to a standing position, using the gait belt to fully support her weight. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs the physical assistance of two or more helpers to complete this activity, so you would code this 01 dependent. This video provided you with an overview of the decision tree for coding GG0130 self care and GG0170 mobility. We reviewed a series of key coding questions to help you identify the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety, appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. We hope you found this video helpful. For more information on coding section GG, refer to your setting-specific guidance manual that can be found on the CMS website. Great, so I hope you all enjoyed that um, brief, I guess, break from my voice. Um, there is some general coding tips that are listed on this screen here. Um, when observing the resident, reviewing the med resident's medical record and interviewing staff, be familiar with the definition of each activity. So you'll notice as we go into the coding scenarios, I'll read the definition out to you guys, and that's sort of the habit we'd like you to get into. So just be familiar with the definition as you're coding the activity. Um, do not record the staff's assessment of the resident's potential capability to perform the activity. Uh, we tend to believe, of course, that our patients can do anything, but um, Again, we want to get, we want to see them actually do the activity when we're determining the code. Um, to clarify your own understanding of the resident's performance of an activity, we do encourage asking probing questions to staff about the resident, beginning with the general and proceeding to more specific. And there are examples of probing questions in the RAI manual. Um, so continuing with general coding tips, I mentioned this earlier, we do not want to record the resident's best performance and do not record the resident's worst performance, but rather we want to record the resident's usual performance during that assessment period. If the resident does not attempt the activity and a helper does not complete the activity for the resident during the entire three-day assessment period, you would code the appropriate activity not attempted code. Um, you'll be using the same six-point scale for recording usual performance and the resident's discharge goals or one of the four activity not attempted codes to specify the reason why an activity was not attempted on both admission and on discharge as well. Um, so documentation in the medical record is used to support the assessment of uh, coding of section GG and then data entered should be consistent with the clinical assessment documentation in the resident's medical record. Um, use of an assistive devices to com or use of assistive devices, excuse me, to complete an activity should not affect the coding of the activity. If the resident does use adaptive equipment and uses the device independently when performing the activity, you would code 06 independent. And if the only help a resident needs to complete an activity for a helper to retrieve an assist is for the helper to re retrieve an assistive device or adaptive equipment such as a cane for walking, you would enter the code 05 setup or cleanup assistance. Um, you just saw in the video, the very last scenario, uh, Mrs. Jones required two helpers. So that's an automatic 01 dependent. Anytime two helpers are required to complete an activity, you can skip to the very bottom and know that it's going to be 01 dependent. Um, another opportunity for Slido here, which example best demonstrates allowing the resident to function as independently as possible? And your choices are A, feeding a resident who can feed himself in order to expedite mealtime, B, allowing the resident to brush her teeth as much as possible, assisting only if she becomes fatigued, C, providing the resident with a bedside commode when he is capable of walking to the bathroom with assistance, or D, all of the above. And I see some responses come in. I'm just going to give you guys a couple more seconds to submit your responses on Slido. Looks like everyone's predominantly leading to B. Let's go ahead and take a look at the correct answer. So it is in fact B, allowing the resident to brush her teeth as much as possible, assisting only if she becomes fatigued. The rationale being, we, you know, as we said earlier, residents should be allowed to perform activities as independently as possible as long as they're safe. 
Um, option B allows the resident to participate in the activity to the fullest extent possible, only receiving assistance from the caregiver as needed. Um, and again, facility and or family should allow independence whenever possible to promote quality of life and sense of well-being. So another opportunity for Slido, since Mr. W uses a quad cane, he cannot be considered independent for the section GG walking items. Your options are either A, true or false. This is a true false question. I'm seeing responses come in pretty rapidly for false. We'll go ahead and take a look at the correct answer. And it is, in fact, false. The rationale, of course, being that activities may be completed with or without a device, assistive device. Um, a resident can be coded independent if she, um, he or she is able to complete the activity without assistance from a helper, even if they are using an assistive device. Okay, um, we're gonna go through use of the dash and then discharge goals, and then we're gonna go ahead and get started with those self-care coding scenarios and give you guys a chance to practice. So um, GG, with GG0130 and GG0170, um, a dash indicates no information, and CMS does expect dash use to be a rare occurrence. You would not use dash if the reason the activity was not observed um, was for any of the reasons listed below, which are your activity not attempted codes. So if the resident refused, you would code 07. If the item was not applicable, you would code 09. If the activity was not attempted due to environmental limitations, you would code 10. And if the activity was not attempted due to a medical condition or safety concern, you would code 88. Again, use the six point scale or the activity not attempted code to code the resident's discharge goals um, use of 7, 0, 09, 10, or 88 is permissible for the discharge goals. And for the SNF QRP completion, at least completion of at least one discharge goal is required um, for one of the self-care or mobility items for each resident. Um, the use of a dash is permissible for any remaining self-care mobility goals that were not coded. Using the dash in this instance and in this instance is allowed um, and it does not affect the APU determina determination. Um, licensed and qualified clinicians can establish a resident's discharge goals at the time of discharge, and this is usually based on prior and current self-care and mobility status, so having those discussions with the resident and their family and asking what their discharge goals are so they can weigh in on that. Um, usually it's based on the clinician's standard of practice. Residents' motivation, of course, to get better, the anticipated length of stay for the resident, um, and the resident's plan discharge setting or home. And the goals should be established as a part of the resident's care plan. So we are gonna go ahead and get started now with um, some coding practice scenarios. As I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna go through each of the definitions and then we'll have an opportunity for you guys to participate with Slido. So um, we're gonna start with GG0130 self-care with the admission performance and you see, again, what's highlighted on the left-hand side column here on your screen. The first one we're gonna go through today is GG0130A, eating. So eating is the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and or liquid to the mouth and swallow food and or liquid once the meal is placed before the resident. I do have some eating coding tips before we go into this scenario. So eating is assessing eating and drinking by mouth only. Residents uh, receive tube feedings or PN. Um, assistance with tube feedings or PN is not considered when coding the eating item. If the resident does not eat or drink by mouth and relies solely on nutrition and liquids through tube feedings or PN because of a new, and that is a recent onset medical condition, you would code GG0130A as 88, not applicable, or excuse me, not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concerns. Um, continuing on with these tips, if the resident does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment and the resident did not eat or drink by mouth prior to the current illness, injury, or exacerbation, you would code GG0130A as 09 not applicable. If the resident eats and drinks by mouth and relies partially on obtaining nutrition and liquids via tube feedings or PN, code eating based on the amount of assistance the resident requires to eat and drink by mouth. 
Um, and this last tip was actually based on help desk questions that we have received. We added this tip. So if the resident eats finger foods with his or her hands, code based on the type and amount of assistance provided. Um, all right, so with eating practice coding scenario. So the dietary opens all of Mr. S's cartons and containers on his food tray before leaving the room. There are no safety concerns regarding Mr. S's ability to eat. Mr. S eats the food himself, bringing the food to his mouth, using, using appropriate utensils and swallowing the food safely. How would you code GG013A eating and what is your rationale? And your options are A, O3, partial or moderate assistance, B, O4, supervision or touching assistance, C, O5, setup or cleanup assistance, or D, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. And I see the responses coming through on Slido, again, quite rapidly, quite uh, heavily in favor of C. And we'll go ahead and take a look at the correct answer now. It is, in fact, C05, setup or cleanup assistance, the rationale being the helper provided setup assistance prior to the eating activity. Okay, we're going to go on to GG0130B now, which is oral hygiene. This is the ability to use suitable items to clean teeth, dentures if applicable, the ability to insert and remove dentures, into and from the mouth and manage denture soaking and rinsing with the use of equipment. Um, if a resident does not perform oral hygiene during therapy, determine the resident's abilities based on performance on the nursing care unit. And again, that can be gathered from talking to some of the facility staff. Um, we're gonna review a second coding example of Mr. Smith's performance as he brushes his teeth. And we're gonna use Slido to practice coding GG0130B. Here you see the helper providing studying assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks to the bathroom using his walker. Once in front of the bathroom sink, the helper applies toothpaste to Mr. Smith's toothbrush and leaves the room. Mr. Smith then brushes his teeth without supervision. Once Mr. Smith is done brushing his teeth, the helper re-engages by cleaning and putting away the oral hygiene items. The helper then provides steadying assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks back to bed. Okay, let's look at the rationale for coding based on the video you just watched. So, GG0130B oral hygiene would be coded 05 setup or cleanup assistance, and the rationale is the helper provided setup assistance by putting toothpaste on Mr. Smith's toothbrush and cleanup assistance by putting away the supplies after Mr. Smith completed the activity. We wouldn't consider the assistance provided getting to or from the bathroom when coding oral hygiene, since that's not part of the definition. All right, we're gonna watch a second video now on oral hygiene um, and give you guys actually an opportunity to participate this time in Slido. Here you see the helper providing assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks to the bathroom. Once in front of the bathroom sink, the helper retrieves and puts toothpaste on Mr. Smith's toothbrush and hands it to him. The helper then steadies Mr. Smith's arm as he brushes his teeth. Once Mr. Smith has finished brushing his teeth, the helper rinses his toothbrush and puts it away. The helper then provides steadying assistance as Mr. Smith walks back to bed. So based on the video you just watched, how would you code GG0130B? Your options are A, O5, setup or cleanup, B, O4, supervision or touching, C, O3, partial or moderate assistance, or D, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. And again, folks are sending in their responses on Slido. It looks like we have a lot of people in favor of B, let's take a look at the correct answer. And it is in fact B, supervision or touching assistance. As we saw in the video, Mr. Smith required the helper to provide supervision or touching assistance in order to complete the activity of oral hygiene. And again, we wouldn't consider the assistance provided while going to, um, to the bathroom to perform oral hygiene. So next we have toileting hygiene. This is the ability to maintain 
perineal hygiene adjust clothes before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. If managing an ostomy include wiping the opening but not managing the equipment. Um, here we have some tips for coating toileting hygiene. Um, it includes managing undergarments, clothing, and incontinence products, and performing perennial cleansing before and after voiding or having a bowel movement. Toileting can take place before and after use of the toilet, commode, bedpan, or urinal. If the resident completes a bowel toileting program in bed, code toileting hygiene based on the resident's need for assistance in managing clothing and perennial cleansing. If the resident does not usually use undergarments, then assess the resident's need for assistance to manage lower body clothing and perennial hygiene. And if the resident has an indwelling urinary catheter and has bowel movements, you would code toileting hygiene um, based on the amount of assistance needed by the resident when moving his or her bowels. So we have a practice coding scenario for GG013C. Mr. W uses a urinal when voiding without assistance with toileting hygiene tasks when sitting on the side of the bed. He uses a toilet with a raised toilet seat when moving his bowels and requires contact guard assistance from the helper as he holds onto a grab bar with one hand, lowers his underwear and pants, performs perianal hygiene, and then pulls up his underwear and pants himself. How would you code GG0130C, toileting hygiene, and what is your rationale? So your choices here are O2, substantial and maximal assistance, B, O3, partial moderate assistance, C, O4, supervision or touching assistance, or D, O6, independent. I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to put in your responses in Slido, and then we'll look at the correct response and the rationale. <clears throat> All right, it looks like we have predominantly C. Let's look at what the correct answer is. The answer is, in fact, O4, supervision or touching assistance, which is C. And the rationale is the helper provides contact guard assistance as a resident completes the activity. Next, we have GG0130E, which is shower, bathe, self. This is the ability to bathe self, including washing, rinsing, and drying self. It does include, exclude, excuse me, washing of the back and hair, and it does not include transferring in and out of the tub or shower. So here we have some coding tips for this item. The assessment can take place in a shower or bath, at a sink, or at the bedside, so with a sponge bath. If the resident bathes himself or herself and a helper sets up materials for bathing or showering, you would code this as 05 setup or cleanup assistance. If a resident cannot bathe his or her entire body because of a medical condition, then you would code shower, bathe, self on the type and amount of assistance needed to complete the activity. So we have a practice coding scenario for this item. Mr. J sits on a tub bench as he washes, rinses, and dries himself. A certified nursing assistant stays with him to ensure his safety, as Mr. J has had instances of losing his sitting balance. The certified nursing assistant also provides lifting assistance as Mr. J gets onto and off the tub bench. So how would you code GG0130E? Your choices are A04, supervision or touching assistance, B, O3, partial or moderate assistance, C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, or D, O1, dependent. And I see responses coming in. We did have a tie there for a second on Slido, but it looks like A is now winning that race. And let's go ahead and take a look at the correct answer. It is, in fact, A04, supervision or touching assistance. The rationale being the helper provides supervision as Mr. J washes, rinses, and dries himself. The transfer onto or off the tub bench is not considered, as we read in the definition, when coding the shower bathe self activity. Okay, next we have upper body dressing. And the definition of upper body dressing is the ability to dress and undress above the waist, including fasteners, if applicable. This is item GG0130F. There are a list here of some upper body dressing items. Again, these are some examples and not an all-inclusive list. 
um, you would assess the resident based on the clothing the um, based on the clothing the resident routinely wears. And we do have an example coding scenario for GG0130F here on the screen. Mr. K sustained a spinal cord injury that has affected both movement and strength in both upper extremities. He places his left hand into one third of his left sleeve of his shirt with much time and effort and is unable to continue with the activity. A certified nursing assistant then completes the remaining upper body dressing for Mr. K. So based on this, how would you code GG0130F? Your choices are A, 04, supervision or touching assistance, B, 03, partial or moderate assistance, C, 02, substantial or maximal assistance, or D, 01, dependent. And I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to submit your responses. It looks like C, people are predominantly favoring C. Let's go ahead and take a look at the correct answer now. And it is in fact C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. The rationale for that, of course, is that Mr. K places his left hand into one third of his left sleeve of his shirt, but can only perform a small portion of the activity of upper body dressing before requiring assistance from the helper, in this case, the certified nursing assistant, who assists in completing this activity. Because the helper provides more than half the effort for upper body dressing, you would code this O2, substantial or maximal assistance. Okay, next we're gonna move on to GG0130G, lower body dressing. This is the ability to dress and undress below the waist, including fasteners, and does not include footwear. You'll see on this screen here some examples of lower body dressing. Again, these are some examples and not an all exhaustive list. The um, clinician should assess the resident based on the clothing the resident, again, routinely wears for lower body. So here's our example for lower body. Mrs. R has per peripheral neuropathy in her upper and lower extremities. She needs assistance from a helper to place her lower limb into and to take it out of her lower limb prosthesis. She needs no assistance to put on and remove her underwear or slacks. So based on this, how would you code GG0130G, lower body dressing, and what is your rationale? Your options are A, O2, substantial or maximal assistance, B, O3, partial or moderate assistance, C, O4, supervision or touching assistance, or D, O6, independent. And it looks like we have most people voting for B. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the correct answer is. And it is in fact B03, partial or moderate assistance. So um, the helper performs less than half the effort for the task of lower body dressing with a prosthesis in this example considered a piece of clothing. Um, Mrs. R needs um, no assistance to put on and remove her underwear or slacks. Um, in contrast, if you were to code this with O4 supervision or touching assistance, that would be used if the helper provided only verbal cues and or touching or setting assistance as the resident completed the activity. Um, she did require some assistance from a helper to place her lower limb into um, and out of her lower limb prosthesis, so that's why that would be coded um, as O3 partial moderate assistance. We do have a provider Q&A, so um, if a resident does not have clothing on the day of admission, do you code 10 not attempted due to environmental limitations, i.e. lack of equipment for dressing? And our answer is the intent for this item is to assess the resident um, clothing that would be worn in the community. If clothing is available by day three, code based on the assessment conducted on that day. If clothing is not available by day three, paper scrubs could be used to assess the activities of upper and lower body dressing. 
and if a resident does not have upper body clothing then other than a hospital gown during the entire three day assessment period, you would not you would use code ten not attempted due to environmental limitations for GG zero one thirty F upper body dressing as a hospital gown is not considered. Okay, we're going to move on to GG 0130H, putting on or taking off footwear. And the definition for this is the ability to put on and take off socks and shoes or other footwear that is appropriate for safe mobility, including fasteners if applicable. So as with the other dressing examples, I do have footwear examples listed on this screen. These are, again, some examples of footwear items. You would assess the resident based on the footwear that the res resident you routinely wears. And again, I just wanna emphasize, this is not an exhaustive list of footwear items. There could be additional items, but this is just an example of some of the items. So here's our example for GG0130H, putting on, taking off footwear. Mr. M is undergoing rehabilitation for right side, upper and lower body weakness following a stroke. He has made significant progress towards his independence and will be discharged to go home tomorrow. Mr. M wears an AFO that he puts on his foot and ankle after he puts his socks on, but before he puts on his shoes. He always places his AFO socks and shoes within easy reach of his bed. While sitting on the bed, he needs to bend over to put on and take off his AFO socks and shoes, and he occasionally loses his sitting balance, requiring staff to place their hands on him to maintain his balance while performing this task. So based on this information, how would you code GG0130H? Your options are A, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, B, 04, supervision or touching assistance, C03 partial or moderate assistance or D02 substantial or maximal assistance. I'll give you guys just a few more seconds to submit your codes to Slido. So I'll see some responses coming in. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the correct answer now. So it is in fact 04 supervision or touching assistance, which is what the majority of you said. Um, and the rationale for that is Mr. M puts on and takes off his AFO socks and shoes by himself. However, because of an occasional loss of balance, he needs a helper to provide touching assistance when he's bending over. That's why you would code this activity supervision, 04 supervision or touching assistance. So we're gonna go through um, GG0130 self-care discharge goals. That's the right-hand side column that you see highlighted on this screen. So some discharge goal coding tips. You code the resident's discharge goals at the snart, start of the SNF PPS stay, five-day PPS, again, using the six-point scale or one of the activity not attempted codes. That's 07, 09, 10 or 88. For the SNF QRP, again, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, a minimum of one self-care or mobility goal must be coded. However, facilities can choose to complete more than one. You would enter a dash for any remaining self-care or mobility goals that were not coded. Using the dash in this allowed instance, again, does not affect APU determination. So licensed and qualified clinicians can establish a resident's discharge goal at the time of admission based on the resident's prior medical conditions, prior and current self-care and mobility status, discussions with resident and family, professional judgment and standards of practice, expected treatments that the resident is going to go through, the resident's motivation to improve, the anticipated length of stay for the resident, and the discharge setting um, or home for the resident. Goals should be established as a part of the resident's care plan. 
So discharge goals and coding tips continue. Discharge goals may be coded the same as the five-day PPS admission performance, higher than the admission performance or lower than the admission performance, and reflect maintenance, improvement, or decline in function respectively. If the admission performance of an activity was coded using one of the activity not attempted codes, so that's 07, 09, 10, or 88, a discharge goal may be coded using the six-point scale if the resident is expected to be able to perform the activity by discharge. So if, for example, the discharge goal code is higher than the five-day PPS admission assessment performance code, um, that's if the clinician residents determine that the resident is expected to main, uh, make gains in function by discharge. Um, the discharge goal could be the same as the five-day PPS admission assessment performance code, and that's if the clinician resident determined the resident is expected to maintain function and not really um, anticipated to progress to a higher level of function for an activity. And then the third option is the clinician determines that a resident with a progressive condition is expected to rapidly decline and that receiving skilled therapy services may slow the decline of function. Um, so we do have section GG0170 mobility. That's the next um, set that we're gonna go through. Um, the first, uh, it's, it's very similar to GG0130, self-care, um, and you'll see the admission performance again highlighted here on the left. I'll go ahead and get us started for this part of the presentation, and Anne will finish up for us. So GG0170A through GG0170D is the bed mobility items. If the clinician determines that bed mobility cannot be assessed because of the degree to which the head of the bed must be elevated because of a recent onset medical condition, then you would code the activities, all the bed mobility activities listed here, which are GG0170A, roll left and right, GG0170B, sit to lying, and GG0170C, lying to sitting on the side of the bed as 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. For GG0170A through C, that's the bed mobility items, clinical judgment should be used to determine what is considered a lying position for the resident. For example, a clinician could determine that the resident's slightly elevated resting position is lying for that resident. So the first item we have here is GG0170A, and the definition is the ability to roll from lying on back to left and right side and return to lying on back on the bed. And here's our practice coding scenario. So Mrs. W's head of the bed must remain slightly elevated at all times due to aspiration precautions. Although the head of the bed is slightly elevated, the therapist uses clinical judgment to determine she can assess Mrs. W's ability to roll left and right. The therapist provides verbal instructions as Mrs. W completes the activity. So how would you code GG0170A? Your choices are A, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, B, 04, supervision or touching assistance, C, 09, not applicable, or D, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. I'll give you guys just a couple of seconds to submit your responses and codes for this scenario. All right, and it looks like people are predominantly leaning towards B, which is 04 supervision touching assistance. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the correct answer is. And it is in fact B, 04 supervision and touching assistance. The rationale being that Mr. D Ms. W, excuse me, requires verbal instructions while rolling left and right in bed. The assessment definition includes lying on back. And in this example, the clinician uses clinical judgment and determines the assessment can be conducted with the head of the bed slightly elevated. So I'll keep going. GG0170B, sit to lying. This is the ability to move from sitting on the side of the bed to lying flat on the bed. 
Here's our coding scenario. Mr. P has peripheral vascular disease and recently had a right above the knee amputation. Mr. P requires the physical therapist to provide steadying assistance due to his poor balance as he moves from a sitting position to lying down. How would you code GG0170B? Your options are A, 05, setup or cleanup assistance, B, 04, supervision or touching assistance, C, 03, partial or moderate assistance, or D, 09, not applicable. People must be changing their mind because one of the Slido answers is getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and take a look at the correct answer. We see everyone's predominantly leaning to B, and it is in fact B04, supervision or touching assistance. The rationale here is that the helper provided only steadying assistance as Mr. P performed the activity. The bed mobility items should be assessed on a bed, not on a raised mat. This includes GG0170A, roll left and right, GG0170B, sit to lying, and GG0170C, lying to sitting on the side of the bed. Okay, next we have GG0170C, lying to sitting on the side of the bed. This is the ability to move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor and with no back support. And we're going to watch a video for this practice coding scenario. Hi, Mrs. Brown. How are you today? I'm doing a little better, thanks. Good. Can you come sit on the side of the bed for me? It's hard, but I'll try. Oh, could you help with my legs? Of course. Good job. Thank you. So um, based on this, GG0170C uh, would be coded as O3 partial or moderate assistance. The reason being that as Mrs. Brown began to move to a seated position, she asked the clinician for help with her legs. The clinician assisted with pivoting Mrs. Brown's legs to the side of the bed and provided assistance that represents less than half of the effort required to complete the activity. We'll take a look at one more video. Hi, Mrs. Brown. How are you today? I'm doing a little better, thanks. Good. Can you come sit on the side of the bed for me? It's hard, but I'll try. Looks like you're struggling a bit. Can I help you? Yes, thanks. Okay, first, let me have you try to lie on your side. Great. Now, put your hand on the bed and push yourself up. As you do that, I'm going to put my hand on your upper back and arm and swing your legs until you're in a seated position. Is that okay? Sure. Let's give it a try. Good job. Thanks. So based on what you just saw, how would you code GG0170C? This is your opportunity to participate in Slido. Your choices are A, O4, supervision or touching assistance. B, O3, partial or moderate assistance. C, O2, substantial or maximal assistance. Or D, O1, dependent. All right, and we'll go ahead and look at what the correct answer is and it's O2 substantial or maximal assistance, the rationale being Mrs. Brown required the clinician to provide lifting and physical assistance that represents more than half the effort to completing the activity of moving from lying on her back to sitting on the side of the bed. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Bridget, who I think is going to dismiss you guys for break. 
So thank you for all the great questions that have been coming in. I've been watching on Slido. You have a lot of great questions. And um, I will be picking off where Manisha left off. My name is Anne. Uh, Bridget mentioned that I would be presenting about Section GG. So we're just going to pick up with the transfer items. Um, again, just as a reminder, as Manisha mentioned, the examples are indeed in your packet. So if you're trying to follow along with the slides, um, you have the examples. This is, um, let's see, handout number 12. And then if you also want to look at your decision tree as you're thinking through the examples, that's uh, handout number 11. And just as uh, Manisha had a lot of interactive questions, we'll be doing the same. So please do have your phones or your laptops ready as we go through the items. OK, so we're going to start uh, with sit to stand. So sit to stand uh, in section GG is defined as the ability to come to a standing position from sitting in a chair, wheelchair, or on the side of the bed. So whatever uh, you do in terms of the assessment, it could be any or all of those activities um, when you're doing the assessment. We do have practice scenario number 13 here related to sit to stand. Um, in this example, we have Ms. R who is your resident. So Ms. R has severe rheumatoid arthritis and uses forearm crutches to ambulate. The certified nursing assistant brings Ms. R her crutches and helps her to stand at the side of the bed. The certified nursing assistant provides some lifting assistance to get Ms. R to a standing position, but provides less than half of the effort co to complete the activity. So as you think about coding this scenario, if you were using the decision tree, your first question would be whether uh, the helper is providing assistance. And of course, in this case, the answer is yes. In this case, the certified nursing assistant is the person providing assistance. So your next question is whether the assistance is only related to setup or cleanup. So would you say there's more going on here, more assistance? Yes. So then the next question would be, does the person, uh, the resident only need uh, verbal uh, or nonverbal cueing, touching, steadying assistance, or more than that? More than that, that's right. And then the next question would be, does the patient resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting the trunk, or lifting or providing trunk support where one helper uh, is providing less than half of the effort? What do you think? Okay, so it does say that the helper is providing less than half of the effort. So again, that's how your decision tree can help you with coding. So how would you code this example, GG0170D for Ms. R? And the options are code three, partial moderate assistance, code two, substantial maximal assistance, code one, dependent, or 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So it looks like we're heading up to about 200 people who have coded that one. And it looks like most people believe the correct response is three. So let's see what the correct response is. It is indeed three. And uh, if you're interested in the rationale, so uh, the helper provided lifting assistance. So it's more than the touching assistance, as you correctly identified as we were going through the decision tree. And it's overall less than half of the effort to complete the activity of sit to stand. So the next uh, uh, activity on the uh, section GG is GG 0170 E. So in this um, item, it's chair, bed to chair transfer. And this refers to the ability to transfer to and from a bed to a chair or wheelchair. I did want to mention that uh, some of the questions that we sometimes get on the help desk refer to the definition of a bed. So in some instances, you may have a resident who uses alternative furniture. So in that case, you can definitely use that alternative furniture instead of a bed. Actually, you can do that whenever the word bed is mentioned for these activities. 
Um, also, uh, the type of transfer can vary, so it could be a stand pivot transfer, it could be a squat transfer, it could be a slide board transfer, let's say somebody who um, has paralysis or lower extremity um, amputations, and so they use a slide board to get from the bed into their wheelchair or into a chair, um, so any kind of transfer is acceptable. Uh, so the activities of lying to sit and lying to sitting on side of the bed are two separate activities that are not assessed as part of GG0170. So the bed to chair transfer actually has a person starting in a sitting position if they're getting out of bed. And if the person is getting back into bed, they would end at a sitting position. So that's why... Um, you know, sit to lying and lying to sit uh, in this first bullet indicate that those are separate activities. If a mechanical lift is used to assist in transferring a resident to a chair or bed to chair transfer and two helpers are required to assist with the mechanical lift transfer, then code O2 dependent, even if the resident assists with part of the chair bed chair transfer. So I do have a couple of clarification points on this uh, uh, bullet. Uh, first of all, so the uh, assistance relates to the resident requiring the assistance of two helpers. So again, if the resident requires the assistance of two helpers, that's a code of one. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to mention uh, relates to this issue, because we've had this question in the past, what if the resident is helping a little bit, don't you give credit for the person, uh, and that would be a code two? And the answer is no. And if you actually go through the decision tree, it'll help you actually figure out how to get to the right answer, in this case a one, because if you look at the questions that are being asked, um, you know, even as we have this uh, question that uh, becomes the setup or cleanup assistance, it talks about assistance from one helper. So if you're answering the questions, it asks about uh, basically, you know, steadying assistance from one helper, lifting assistance from one helper, and then if the answer is no to uh, the lifting support, uh, more than half the effort, it's only one helper. So that'll take you down to the next, the last question basically to go to code one if there's two or more people helping. So does that make sense? So even if the person provides a little bit of help, if it was one helper, that would be a code two. But if two helpers are required, the uh, resident requires the assistance of two helpers, it's always going to be a level one. Okay, so the next uh, practice scenario is for chair bed to chair transfer. And in this example is a little bit longer. So again, if you wanna follow along in your packet um, examples, feel free to do that. So Mr. Yu had his left lower leg amputated because of gangrene associated with his diabetes. And he has reduced sensation and strength on his right leg. He has not yet received his below the knee prosthesis. Mr. Yu uses a transfer board from the chair to uh, bed to chair transfers. The therapist places the transfer board under his buttocks. Mr. Yu then attempts to scoot from the bed in, onto the transfer board. Mr. Yu has reduced sensation in his hands and limited upper extremity, upper body strength. The physical therapist assists him in side scooting by lifting his trunk in a rocking motion as Mr. Yu scoots across the transfer board and into the wheelchair. Overall, the therapist provides more than half of the effort. So as you think about the decision tree, so it's more than setup assistance, right? And it's more than just touching steadying assistance. And so then you're either going to be three or below. And so you have to make your judgment is the resident providing more than half of the effort, then it would be a three. If the helper is providing more than half of the effort, it would be a two. If the resident is doing any effort, they can be a two. If two or more helpers, it would be a level one. So in this case, again, it's a slide board transfer and the physical therapist is helping to lift the person to, and helping with rocking motion. And it says overall, the therapist provides more than half of the effort. So how would you code GG0170E? If you believe the correct response is four, 
supervision touching assistance, that would be A. Next option is three, partial moderate assistance. The next option is two, substantial maximal assistance. And then there's the option of one, dependent. Okay, looks like maybe more people came back after the break because we're almost, almost at 300 people who are answering this question. There we go, 299, there we go, we broke 300. Okay, so it looks like most people coded two, and I agree with that response. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see indeed that is the correct response. And the rationale here is, um, again, O2, substantial maximal assistance. The helper provided more than half of the effort for the resident to complete the activity of chair bed to chair transfer. The next activity is toilet transfer, and this is simply getting on and off a toilet or commode. So a couple of uh, points about this that are important based on help desk questions that you've submitted in the past or submitted to training questions in the past. Uh, do not consider or include the activities related to toileting hygiene that Manisha covered earlier. So if you remember correctly, Manisha talked about toileting hygiene referring to managing clothing, so maybe pulling pants down, doing some perineal hygiene, cleansing, and pulling pants back up. So this really, uh, this toilet uh, transfer activity, which is mobility focused, is really about getting on and off the toilet. It is entirely possible that perhaps somebody is using a grab bar and they're holding onto the grab bar as they maybe are doing some toileting hygiene and also as they're transferring. So, uh, and maybe they have steadying assistance being provided at the same time while they're doing both the toileting hygiene and the transfer and you're just, you know, continually touching the person. The, the resident may get coded a level four in both of, for both of those activities. But do keep in mind that they are distinct activities in terms of the coding process. Um, we have had this question in the past, does getting on and off a bedpan count? And the answer is no. Uh, it really is about getting on and off either a bedside commode or a toilet. We have scenario number 15 here for you to review and code. So in this particular example, we have Mrs. M. So she has had a total hip replacement following a hip fracture. And she was in an acute care hospital prior to being transferred to your skilled nursing facility. While in the acute care hospital, she used a raised toilet seat. When Ms. M needs to void, the certified nursing assistants provide standing assistance as Ms. M transfers safely from the wheelchair to the raised toilet seat. So how would you code in this instance? Uh, in this case, the helper is a certified nursing assistant and she is providing steadying assistance. The options that you have to choose from are five set up cleanup assistance, four supervision touching assistance, O2 substantial maximal assistance, or nine not applicable. I think Manisha uh, covered that you can obviously assess patients with or without an assistive device. In this case, it's a raised toilet seat that was used that doesn't affect the coding in terms of increasing or decreasing the actual score, but you can code based on the type and amount of assistance a resident requires with that assistive device to raise toilet seat. So it looks like most of you coded a four, and I do agree with that response. Um, so that is c the correct response. Um, the rationale being the certified nursing assistance provides only touching assistance during the activity. The raised toilet seat used during the initial assessment and was previously used in the acute care hospital. Activities may be scored with or without assistive devices. The next activity is car transfer. And in this instance, the definition of a car transfer for section GG is the ability to transfer in and out of a car or a van on the passenger side. It does not include the ability to open or close the door or to fasten a, a seat belt. We've also had questions recently about whether it, um, you take into consideration assistance getting to and from the car, and the answer is no. It truly is just getting basically from beside the car on the passenger side into that passenger side. 
So we've had quite a few questions about this in the past. So as Manisha mentioned, we've um, added coding tips in recent manuals, and I know there were some questions that came in through Slido that I was kind of looking at um, uh, as Manisha was presenting earlier. Um, so use of an indoor car can be used to simulate outdoor car transfers. These full or half cars uh, would need to have similar features to a real car, so a car seat within a car cabin. Um, there was a question I think somebody submitted about uh, what if you don't have a simulator or an, uh, an outdoor car um, available for assessment. So uh, as much as you could simulate it, you'll be using your clinical judgment, um, but there's not strict guidelines on what counts or what doesn't count. I think we've had all kinds of questions over the years, like does a golf cart count? Um, so I think you'd be using your clinical judgment, but the idea is that uh, you would feel comfortable that if the person did the simulation, however you designed it, that you would feel comfortable that person could safely, or the family member with the patient, with the resident, could get safely in and out of a car. That's the intent. Um, car transfers uh, do not include transfers into the driver's seat, open and closing the car door, fastening or unfastening the seat belt. In the event of inclement weather, so for those of you who might be doing assessments outdoors, um, in the event of inclement weather or if an indoor car simulator is not available or outdoor car is not available during, during the entire three-day assessment period, use code 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. Um, the code 10, as you uh, may know, was actually uh, became available in October of 2018. So that was not a code that was available um, when the GG items were first released. And in general, we don't expect uh, code 10 to be used that often. The car transfer is a good example where the code 10 makes sense, but please don't code code 10 for things like eating. I'm not quite sure what that means. You don't have food. Um, I'm not, I have seen a few code 10s, so please be careful about coding 10. But in this case, not having uh, and the car simulator is a great example of a code 10 that is an appropriate code. So we do have another uh, practice scenario for you here. Um, so again, to our transfer during her uh, rehabilitation stay in the skilled nursing facility, Mrs. N works with an occupational therapist on transfers in and out of a passenger side of a car. On the day before discharge, when performing car transfers, Ms. N requires verbal reminders for safety and light touching assistance. The therapist instructs her on strategic hand placement while Ms. N transitions to sitting on this uh, car car's passenger seat, the therapist opens and closes the door. So first of all, you get to ignore the, right, the last sentence, right? Because opening and closing the door doesn't count in terms of the coding. So basically what you're going to focus on is that there's verbal reminders related to safety, there is light touching assistance, and the ther therapist, so the verbal cues it looks like is instruction on uh, strategic hand placement during the transition. So how would you code uh, Ms. N? The options are on Slido, if you select A, code five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision touching assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance, code one, dependent would be D. Looks like there's still some answers coming in. Might be those of you who are watching online. Okay, we're getting very close to 300. Okay, I will. Uh, so it looks like most of you coded four, and I do agree with that. Um, so in this case, there was, um, let's see, yep, yeah, code four. Um, so in this case, there was uh, the resident transfers into the passenger side of the car, so that meets the criteria of the activity. Um, we ignored opening, closing the door, and there was touching assistance as well as some verbal assistance. Um, in terms of the uh, category four, um, the um, 
verbal cueing can be intermittent or throughout, you would still have a code four. It doesn't matter. It does, the, the code four doesn't differentiate whether the verbal cueing or studying was provided throughout or intermittently. So next, moving on to the walking items. So as you know, there are several walking activities with various distances. So we have a fair number of coding tips uh, related to walking, and we've had quite a few questions um, over the years, um, and so these are kind of the highlights to help you with accurate coding. So the walking activities do not need to occur in one session, but if they do occur in one session, that is acceptable. Um, so you'd be using your clinical judgment to do an assessment of the resident, but if somebody, um, it was very difficult for them, let's say, to go 50 feet with two turns, you might be doing the 150 feet at a different point in time. To the extent that uh, you may have a resident who is able to travel 150 feet, you can code the 10 feet based on the 150 feet, but please obviously be aware that the um, there is an activity of 50 feet with two turns, and that would be assessed different separately than the 150 feet because obviously the 150 feet doesn't have turns, so those would ne need to be done separately. But to the extent that if a resident walks 150 feet, you can determine 10 feet based on that um, if the person, for example, only needs studying assistance throughout the 150 feet. You could infer the 10 feet code based on that distance. The residents may take a brief standing break while walking, but the uh, resident may not sit down for a break in the middle of the 150 feet. That question's come up quite a bit. You will use your clinical judgment to determine what a brief standing break is, and that, you know, we leave that to you, your discretion. Um, when coding uh, GG0170 walking items, do not consider the resident's mobility performance when using parallel bars. Um, in general, uh, anything that, uh, any equipment or devices that are really only used during therapy sessions and the person cannot use that device, let's say somebody cannot use parallel bars when they have to get up to go to the bathroom from their bed to the bathroom. The parallel bars are not available for them at that point, and so that's part of the rationale. Um, so again, uh, equipment or assistive devices that are used in therapy only and cannot be used while the person is on the nursing unit or um, in the dining room, uh, you would not consider those. Uh, par parallel bars are not portable. Um, if safe, assess and code walking use, using a portable uh, walking device. If the resident cannot walk without the use of parallel bars due, due to his or her recent onset medical condition or due to safety concerns, and that is during the entire three-day assessment period that the person is only able to walk in parallel bars, and so they really don't meet the criteria for walking for the Section GG items because the uh, parallel bars are not portable, uh, you would code 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. And I do want to highlight that um, in this particular example, we say it's a recent onset condition and that's why it's coded 88. If the person had, let's say, um, long-standing paralysis, let's say somebody had a spinal cord injury 20 years ago, have, has been in a wheelchair and was not able to walk um, so it's not a recent onset, but the person prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury uh, was not walking, and they're not walking at the time of the assessment, that's a code 09, not applicable. So again, the 09 indicates the person does not do the activity at the time of assessment and did not do it prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. If the person was doing it prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, but cannot do it at the time of the assessment, that would be a code 88. So the first activity is walk 10 feet. So this starts once the person is in a standing position and it refers to the ability to walk 10 feet in a room, corridor, or similar space. If the admission performance for this activity is coded one of the activity not attempted codes, we will infer that the person is not able to walk the longer distances and so you will be skipping over those activities so in an 
IT software system, you wouldn't be able to answer the uh, remaining walking um, activities. You would skip over to the stairs items. So the activity not attempted codes, just as a reminder, Manisha covered these. These are the code seven, uh, refuse, resident refusal, 09, not applicable, 10, the environmental limitations, or 88, uh, recent onset medical condition or safety concern. So again, this is just the skip pattern and um, you, you would skip uh, to the one step curb. It is possible for somebody to go up and down a curb or a step in a wheelchair. So that's why uh, even though somebody might not be able to uh, walk 10 feet, uh, they may be able to go up and down the one step or curb. So another coding tip, uh, use of assistive devices or adaptive equipment, for instance, a cane required to the, for the uh, walking activity would not affect the coding of the activity. And what that means is actually you don't increase or decrease the score just because somebody uses an assistive device. If somebody uses an assistive device, you code them based on the type and amount of assistance that's required for that um, device that's in use at that point in time. If somebody changes to use a different type of device, so it's possible somebody, let's say, um, a, on one assessment is using a walker, and in another assessment they're using uh, a quad cane, another assessment they're using a straight cane, let's say by discharge, so they might be changing assistive devices over time. The rating scale focuses on the type and amount of human assistance that's provided. So it's all about whether the person maybe, let's say, continued to require supervision, the code would continue to be supervision. So we have another practice scenario here. Um, this is for walk 10 feet. Um, so this time we have Mr. S. So Mr. S had an open reduction internal fixation on his left leg, lower leg after a fall. So it's a recent onset condition and is non-weight bearing on his left lower extremity. Mr. S walks 10 feet in the parallel bars with the physical therapist providing more than half of the effort to support his trunk. So what do you think? Let's see what your thinking is in terms of the coding. If you think the correct code is one, dependent, press A, or two, substantial maximal assistance, or three, partial moderate assistance, or D, 88, not attempted to, due to a medical condition or safety concern. All right, so. For those of you who coded 88, what was the key thing that made you think that? Parallel bars. bars, okay, that's right. So those of you who maybe have other answers can still change. I think you can still change your answers. All right, I see it going down, thank you. So yes, in this case, it was a bit tricky. We kind of distracted you, giving you the type and amount of assistance, and I talked about human assistance, but uh, as most of you realized, it, the parallel bars in this case was the key issue. So that's correct. Um, so we've got 327 of you coding 88. I agree with that response. And again, the rationale, you told me, parallel bars. Okay, so the next activity is walk 50 feet with two turns. Um, so in this case, again, the person starts in the standing position and this refers to the ability to walk 50 feet and make two turns. We do get questions about what a turn is. So the definition for the section GG items is that uh, turns are 90 degree turns. Uh, they may be uh, the turns in the same direction, so uh, two right turns or two left turns, or they could be turns in different directions, so one left turn and one right turn. The 90 degree turn should occur at the person's ability level and can include the use of an assistive device as appropriate, for example, a cane. Um, and again, the use of an assistive device does not increase or decrease. The coding is just based on the type and amount of a human assistance being provided. So we have a practice scenario related to this activity. So Mr. R had a, um, a chronic neurologic condition and he has, um, as a result, uh, poor balance. Uh, so he's used a walker for many years. Uh, he ambulates 50 feet and he makes two 90 degree turns 
uh, while requiring contact guard as he turns. So it looks like maybe he's uh, able to walk without somebody uh, maybe touching him uh, for part of this activity, but he does require somebody to uh, provide contact guard as he turns. And so how would you code uh, Mr. R? So the options are code five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, nine, not applicable. Okay, I'll give you another minute. I always like to see it go up to 300, so almost there. Okay. All right, we're 307. Okay, so it looks like most of you coded 04. It looks like one person coded three. I agree with the majority of 04 supervision touching assistance. So again, the helper provided uh, contact guard assistance during this activity. One thing I would like to mention about the walking activities is that if a resident cannot go the full distance, a helper cannot actually walk for the resident. So let's say some, a resident is able to walk 40 feet and we're going to be coding 150 feet or actually maybe even 50 feet with two turns. Because I cannot actually help complete the activity, in the case where somebody does not walk the full distance, you would code that the, one of the appropriate activity not attempted code. So if somebody can go 10 feet, uh, but they can't go more than 10 feet, the 50 feet with two turns and 150 feet um, activities would be coded the appropriate activity not attempted code. So maybe an 88 or 09. And again, if the activity was not completed, then you're not in a position to know how much effort was actually needed to complete the activity. So if the person is only able to go 10 feet, you're not in a position to make a judgment about how much effort was needed to complete 150 feet because you can't complete the rest of the activity. You can't go the remaining distance. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so 150 feet is the next activity. So this begins once the person is in a standing position. And uh, again, it can be walking in a corridor or a similar space. So we have uh, in this example, Ms. Mrs. T, so she walks with her walker 150 feet independently as long as she takes a long, uh, takes a very brief standing rest break halfway through the walk. So are you concerned about the rest break? No, that's okay, that's right. Okay, so what do you think? What would her uh, the, the activity be coded for her. The options are six, independent, five, set up or clean up assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, or nine, not applicable. Okay, let's wait to get to a few more. Okay, great, okay, there's more than 300. Okay, so it looks like most people are coding six independent, I do agree with that. And so uh, the correct response here is um, 06 independent, and as you indicated to me, it is okay to take a resting uh, short breather. Um, again, sitting down would not be acceptable, but uh, as, considering the activity to be completed, but taking a standing resting break is, is certainly very um, acceptable. The next activity is walking on uneven surfaces. So in this case, um, this refers to the ability to walk on uneven or sloping surfaces. It can be indoor or outdoor. It can include things like turf or gravel. We get all kinds of questions about what is acceptable or not acceptable. I know some uh, facilities have set up some kind of obstacle courses or sometimes put down you know, different types of services, so you'd be using your clinical judgment, but again, the idea is that it um, gives 
at least a bit of a challenge to somebody who maybe has some balance problems to make sure that if they were walking on an uneven pavement or, or something like that, that they'd be able to safely navigate at least 10 feet. I know I live in Chicago, and if you want to walk down in downtown Chicago, Magnificent Mile, you definitely need to be sure that you can do these, um, you know, being able to keep your balance with uneven surfaces. Okay, so we have another example here. So um, Mr. B sustained an incomplete spinal cord injury after a car accident. He ambulates um, outside on grass and negotiates the turf with the therapist providing more than half of the effort to support his trunk. How would you code Mr. B? The options are code five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, O2, substantial maximal assistance. And um, I do believe it said that the therapist provided more than half of the effort for those of you trying to decide between code two and code three. So um, the therapist providing more than half of the effort. So the therapist providing more than half of the effort is what code? Two. And if the uh, Resident is doing more than half the effort, it's three. So in this case, the helper was providing more than half of the effort. So it looks like most people did indeed code two. I do agree with that. And so you can see that is the correct response. And the rationale, the therapist provides more than half of the effort in order for the resident to ambulate 10 feet on an uneven surface. This is actually another activity where we won't be surprised to see a code 10 if it's difficult for you to go outside and walk in um, grass, especially when it's cold and icy outside. Um, so you not, might not wanna really challenge somebody with ice. Um, and so you might code 10, but again, you know, not all of the activities, the 10 code makes a whole lot of sense, but this is one of them that it does make sense. So the next um, series of activities focus on steps and also uh, the last activity, which is pick up object. So the first step item is one step um, or a curb. So the ability to go up and down a curb and or one step, it can be one or the other. If um, admission performance is coded, one of the activity not attempted codes, so that would be 07, 09, 10, or 88 we will um, assume that if somebody cannot go up and down one step, that they're not able to go up and down four steps or 12 steps, so you will just skip over to the pick up object activity. Um, again, um, code seven refers to patient refusal, 09, not actable, uh, 10, um, environmental limitation, and 88 uh, refers to a recent onset medical condition or safety concern. So again, skip pattern, I just covered that. So again, you'd skip to the pick up object. Um, so we do have an example here of Mrs. Z. So Mrs. Z has had a stroke. She must be able to step up and down one step to enter her home. A physical therapist provides standby assistance as she uses her quad cane to support her balance in stepping up one step. The physical therapist provides steadying assistance as Mrs. Z uses her cane for balance and steps down one step. So um, as we're paying it, uh, as we're deciphering this example, um, it looks like there's uh, steadying assistance being, so let's see, the physical therapist provides standby assistance as she goes up one step. So. Stead, uh, standby assistance is basically supervision. And then on the way down, she does require a little bit more assistance. It's uh, steadying assistance in this case. Um, so you need to pay attention to both going up the steps and both going down the steps when you consider coding. So how would you code this example? The options are 04, supervision or touching assistance, 03, partial moderate assistance, 02, substantial maximal assistance, 01, dependent. 
So the Code 4 has a pretty broad definition. Uh, it can include things like supervision, verbal, touching assistance. Uh, as I mentioned before, it can be intermittent or it can be um, constant throughout the activity, but it is kind of a broad uh, range of assistance that's being provided. Um, so it looks like most people did code 04 for that activity, and I agree with that response. So the rationale there is that the helper provides touching assistance as Ms. C completes the activity of stepping up and down one step. So I guess it was actually standby to go up, up the step and uh, touching assistance going down the step. The next um, activity is four steps. So four steps refers to the ability to go up and down four steps with or without uh, railing. Uh, similar to the prior activity, if the uh, resident is not able to go up and down four steps, we're going to assume that the resident is not able to go up and down 12 steps. So there is a skip pattern over to the pick up object activity. So again, um, the activity not a code activity not attempted codes include code 7, 9, 10, and 88. And again, this is the skip pattern. So here we have um, an example of Mr. F. So he is recovering from a multiple lower extremity fracture and wears a walking boot and uses a quad cane. Mr. F slowly ascends and descends the stairs, grabbing the stair railing with one hand and the quad cane with his other hand. So in this case, he's got a couple of uh, devices, equipment that he's relying on. So again, the bottom line is we're gonna be coding based on the type and amount of human assistance, regardless of whether devices are used, regardless of the number of devices used. The therapist provides intermittent steadying assistance as he climbs up the four steps he then turns around and requires steadying assistance throughout the activity as he goes down the four steps. How would you code Mr. F? So again, he's climbing up with intermittent steadying assistance on the way down. He requires steadying assistance throughout the activity. The options for you to code are five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, or two, substantial maximal assistance. Okay. Looks like most people are heading towards code four. We'll wait till it gets to about 300. Okay, great. So I do agree with code four in this example, and the rationale is that Mr. F requires steadying assistance intermittently going up the stairs, and then through, um, throughout the activity, uh, he requires steadying assistance throughout the activities when he's going down the stairs. If steadying assistance is intermittent or throughout the activity, the code would be the same, 04. Mr. F does not require weight bearing or lifting assistance in this example. We um, do sometimes get questions about stairs and whether going up and down stairs needs to occur at the same time, and the answer is no. You can assess a uh, resident going up the stairs and the person can take a break and then go down the stairs. That's um, perfectly acceptable, or if you're in some stairwells where the person maybe is just going downstairs um, and then later on being assessed going up the stairs. Um, We've been asked if somebody can take a break in between, and the answer is yes for that also, if they're being done together. The last um, activity is 12 steps. Um, the ability to uh, go up and down 12 steps, it, and as with all the um, steps items, it can be with or without a railing. So in our practice scenario here, which is number 23, if you're following along in the packet, um, Ms. Y is recovering from a stroke resulting in motor activities and poor endurance. Ms. Y's home has 12 stairs with a railing and she needs to use these stairs to enter and exit her home. And so this is something that's going to be worked on during the skilled nursing. Um, program. Her physical therapist uses a gate belt around her trunk and supports less than half of the effort as Ms. Y ascends 
and then descends 12 steps. So again, the key here is that um, this resident does need to be able to go up and down 12 steps in order to get into a residence as part of her discharge plan. The physical therapist is helping her to work on going up and down stairs, and the therapist uses a gate belt and supports less than half of the effort. So how would you code uh, Miss Y? Uh, the options are 05, set up and clean up assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, oops, sorry. <laughs> you didn't see that. <laughs> okay, three, partial moderate assistance or O2, substantial maximal assistance, sorry about that. That's all right, it's getting near the end of the day, right? All right, so, um, all right, we've got almost 300 people responding. Yeah, we've reached 300 there. So um, code three, partial moderate assistance, is indeed the correct response. Um, and the rationale here is the helper provides less than half of the effort required to provide the necessary support as Ms. Y, um, for Ms. Y as she ascends and descends the 12 steps. Okay, so we, um, as I said, sometimes do get questions, and I think actually this might have been one of the questions that we had related to um, stairs in the most recent training we did in May. So the question that was submitted, if a resident cannot complete an activity because they state they are simply tired, fatigued, or exhausted, should we code this as a refusal? So that would be the 07, resident refused, or 88 for safety concerns. For example, a resident completes eight out of the 12 stairs and then says they are done. <laughs> So, um, so the answer is that you're going to be using your clinical judgment, um, and so we just give you some scenarios just as an idea to kind of play out what options there may be. So if you or the resident believe that there's a safety concern and the activity could not be completed as a result of that safety concern, you can code it 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. So for example, if somebody's recovering from a stroke or maybe somebody um, has multiple sclerosis or some other condition that you know that fatigue is a common symptom, you may certainly use your judgment to say, this is you know somebody who is really you know, they're not refusing, they truly are legitimately feeling fatigued or feeling unsafe. Maybe it's somebody who has a balance problem and your judgment is that they're really concerned about falling and they're just very anxious about that and, and that is making it difficult for them to complete the activity. And so you might use your judgment to say 88 in that case. If you determine that the resident is refusing to perform the activity and that there's no underlying medical or safety concern associated with their refusal, you could certainly code seven, patient resident refused. If the resident completes the activity once during the assessment period, you can still code it using the 01 through 06 codes. So it's possible that maybe Somebody had a long day in therapy and then uh, maybe, you know, for whatever reason, they were being assessed at the end of the day to go up and down stairs. And so this person was legitimately not feeling well. Maybe they hadn't eaten well or something that day. And so it really didn't represent what that person's ability level was. And so if they were able to do it the next day, you could certainly code if that's, let, if the next day, let's say it's the third day uh, um, after the person was admitted, you could certainly use the assessment based on the third day if you didn't think that the, the person was able to do kind of their best ability um, on that second day. Okay, the um, next activity is pick up object. And um, I know one of the questions that came in, I think it actually came in earlier today, even before Manisha spoke, um, asked whether this activity needs to be completed from a standing position, and the answer is yes. You have to be in a standing position to perform this activity, and it refers to the ability to bend or stoop from a standing position to pick up a small object, such as a spoon, from the floor. So we do have another example here. Ms. C has recently undergone a hip replacement. When she drops items, she uses a long-handled reacher and she that she has been using at home prior to the 
the admission. She is ready for discharge and can now ambulate with a walker without assistance. When she drops objects from her basket on her walker, she requires a certified nursing assistant to locate her long-handled reacher and bring it to her in order for her to use it. The CNA reach, uh, leaves the reacher with Ms. C so that she has it handy um, for when it is needed next. She does not need assistance to pick up the object after the helper brings her the reacher. So in this scenario, the uh, somebody did have to bring it to her. Obviously, you know, if in the future she decided to keep it attached to her, um, to her, her walker or she kept it with her, potentially, you know, she could be coded independent. But in this case, somebody had to bring the um, device for her so that she could be able to use it and uh, be safe. So how would you code this instance where somebody had to bring the uh, reacher for her. The options are 06, independent, 5, setup or cleanup assistance, 04, supervision touching assistance, 03, partial moderate assistance. Okay. Looks like most people are putting in a code 5. I'm getting close to 100, 300. Okay, great. Okay, so I do agree. Code five is the correct response. And the rationale here is that the helper provides setup assistance so that Ms. C can use her long handled reacher. All right, next we're moving to the wheelchair items. So the, the wheelchair items, uh, we'll start off actually with what we call with um, a gateway question. Basically, does somebody use a wheelchair? So if the uh, resident does not use a wheelchair, you'll be able to skip over all the wheelchair items, but this first one basically is just the simple question, does a resident use a wheelchair and or scooter? If the answer is no, you will skip over to section H, and we're done with section GG. If the answer is yes, you will continue on to the, ne the next activity, which is wheel 50 feet with two turns. We do get a fair number of questions about this particular um, item. Uh, it really does refer to whether somebody uses a wheelchair or scooter to mobilize. So the intent of the wheelchair mobility items is to assess the ability of the resident who is perhaps learning how to self-mobilize using a wheelchair or maybe somebody who used a wheelchair prior to admission. Use clinical judgment to determine whether the resident's use of the wheelchair is for self-mobilization um, as a result of the resident's medical condition, or perhaps it is just used for staff convenience. If somebody is just being pushed in a wheelchair because that's a way to get to therapy, they're not really using a wheelchair. Um, so, you know, this... As with all of the activities in Section GG, you would be thinking about a clinical assessment where the person is um, allowed to be as independent as possible. So if somebody is new to using a wheelchair, maybe they don't quite know how to use it yet, but you might be kind of assessing to see if they can start to perhaps uh, use their feet to mobilize, and so you might be observing them on admission using this device. If the resident walks and is not uh, learning how to mobilize in a wheelchair and only uses a wheelchair for transport, staff convenience, transport between locations and within the facility, again for staff convenient, code the wheelchair gateway item at admission and discharge as no and you can skip the remaining act, uh, activities. So the first activity, there's two uh, wheelchair distances. So the first one is uh, wheel 50 feet with two turns. This begins once the person is in a seated position in the wheelchair or scooter, and the person must be able to travel 50 feet and make two turns. Uh, when we talk about two turns, think about somebody you know, turning into their room or maybe somebody who turns into a bathroom. Those are still turns, obviously. Um, and, and again, uh, 50 feet and, and two turns for this particular activity. When I talked about um, the walking items, remember I said that if somebody is only able to go, a, only able to walk 10 feet 
I can't walk the remaining distance for that person, and so the activity can't be completed in order for us to determine overall effort. In the case of wheelchair, if somebody is able to travel 10 feet, somebody can push them the rest of the distance, so you are able to determine the the um, effort required to complete the activity. So if, some, if a resident travels five feet, 10 feet, 50 feet, 500 feet, you can code the wheelchair activities. We do obviously have this turns in these particular items. So I talked about turning into rooms. The definition is similar to, or the same as, I should say, as for the walking items, the turns are 90 degree turns. They can be in the same direction. They can be in different directions, one left, one right. Um, and the uh, 90 degree turn should occur at the person's ability level. So we do have a scenario here, number 25, if you're following along in your packet. Once seated in a manual wheelchair, Mr. R wheels 10 feet, then asks the certified nursing assistant to push the wheelchair an additional 40 feet into her room and her bathroom. So some people say, did you really have turns in there? So into the room and into the bathroom, uh, you can interpret those to mean turns. So in this case, um, you know, think about who's providing more effort as you're thinking about uh, whether the, well, you'll also be considering whether the activity was uh, completed in this case, uh, 50 feet with two turns. And then if the activity was completed, who uh, provided what type and amount of assistance? So the options are 04, supervision, touching assistance, 03, partial, moderate assistance, 02, substantial, maximal assistance, 01, dependent. So again, the resident was able to go 10 feet in this example. So the helper was pushing 40 feet and those two turns did occur. So if you're, again, going through the decision tree, obviously more than setup assistance, more than supervision, um, only, only one person helping. So um, uh, more than half of the effort being uh, provided by the resident and the helper providing less than half the effort is a three. If the helper is providing more than half of the effort, it's a two. Uh, you would only code level one if the helper provides all of the effort to complete the activity or the assistance of two or more helpers is required to complete the activity. And I'm reading right from the decision tree. So again, handy reference if you're trying to figure out codes. So it looks like most people coded O2. Um, I do agree with that response. Um, again, the helper provided more than half of the effort but was not providing all of the effort. So that's why it's not a level one. You'll notice that for the two wheelchair activities, we, um, there is a follow-up question. So we just covered the 50 feet with two turns. And so the follow-up question asks whether the type of wheelchair um, or scooter that was used is manual or motorized. So we'd just code one for manual, two for motorized. You'll notice on the data set that following the next activity, so we'll cover that in just a minute, wheeling 150 feet, there's also a follow-up question after that activity asking again the type of wheelchair or scooter used, one for manual and two for motorized. Sometimes get asked, why are we being asked the same question twice? It is possible that somebody uses a different uh, type of device for shorter versus longer distances, and that's the rationale. So again, last activity, uh, wheel 150 feet, uh, once seated in a wheelchair or scooter, and uh, the ability to travel at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. So the coding scenario here, number 26, is Mr. W, and uh, he is recovering from a stroke and has right-sided weakness that affects his balance and his chronic respiratory condition that affects his walking endurance. By discharge, Mr. W 
slowly wheels a manual wheelchair 160 feet down the hallway without any assistance from a helper. So we tried to make the last example an easier one for you. So what, what do you think? How would you code Mr. W? Your options are 04, supervision or touching assistance, 07, resident, ref 07, resident refused, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or, or safety concerns, 06, independent. This gentleman is ready for discharge, I think. As you may say, you are ready for <laughs> the end of the day. We're wrapping up here shortly. All right, looks like most people coded 06. I do agree with that response. And it looks like we're getting to 300 people there. So again, rationale, he was independent. Uh, it said he did not require any assistance. So um, just wanted to wrap up talking about the goals. So I believe Manisha covered this um, for each of the activities. There was the opportunity to enter a goal. A goal can be um, focused on improvement where in that case, the goal code would be higher than the admission code. Um, if the goal is to maintain function, so maybe somebody is admitted, um, let's say, uh, toilet transfer, their studying assistance, and the goal is to maintain that. Maybe somebody has a progressive neurologic condition, but the goal is to maintain that. Um, they could be coded the same at discharge. It's also possible that uh, somebody is expected to have decline, and so the c code might be a little bit lower for the goal in some instances. Um, just in terms of wrapping up, I did want to mention, and I do believe there have been questions about this, so um, I wanted to be sure that you're aware that the uh, Section GG video links are available on the website, so CMS released a series of short videos to assist providers in coding select GG data elements. Um, these videos, ranging from 4 to 12 minutes, are designed to provide targeted guidance using simulated patient scenarios. So you can access those links if you download the slides. You can um, use the links that are on the slides. Uh, CMS is also offering a newly released updated web-based training course on how to accurately code Section GG data elements. It's a 45-minute course. Um, it's available on demand and can be used on any device, um, anywhere that you have access to a browser. The courses are divided into four lessons and include scenarios and exercise that allow you to test your knowledge with real-life scenarios. Um, so there's um, four lessons here. I'll let you read this on your own. And again, the link is on the slide. If you wanted to download the slides, you can get the link. So in summary, thank you so much for your attention this late in the day. Really appreciate <laughs> you hanging in there for GG. And I'm sure you want to do some mobility yourselves at this point. But we've covered, uh, uh, you've had hopefully gained some knowledge related to the Section GG mobility goals um, area. You've learned about the intent of the items and applied coding accuracy. I think I'm going to let Bridget step up here because she's going to do the wrap up. Um, and please do submit your questions through Slido. We'll be happy to provide responses. And uh, Bridget, come on up. All right.